Live from the JSA Podcast Studio, presenting Data Movers, showcasing the leaders behind the headlines in the telecom and data center infrastructure industry. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Data Movers. I'm your host, Jamie Scott Okataya, CEO and founder of JSA, along with my fabulous co-host, top B2B social media influencer, Mr. Evan Christel. Hey, Evan. How are you? Welcome to Data Movers, where we sit down with the most influential men and women in the new world of data centers and telecom, enabling this transition to uh, a new normal. Jamie, you're in the LA area. Did you see the news? Disneyland is reopening. I am so excited. Uh, Did you get your mouse ears? Are you, are you going to be first in line? I, you know, I, I just have them portable. I, I put my hands on top of my head and <laughs> there's my mom's ears. Um, but uh, obviously having a 10 month old baby girl, I'm like, can't wait until, um, well, I finally have an excuse, my husband and I. <laughs> <laughs> she's not gonna remember anything by the way. So she's have, gonna have no recollection of the experience, but I am, I'm actually looking forward to getting back to a theme park now that I've been vaccinated and and having some normal experiences again. And speaking of, of theme parks and uh, Orlando, our next guest I think is from that area, right, Tampa? Mm-hmm, yes, Correct. So let's, let's uh, get right to it. Um, today we welcome Mr. Brad Foster, partner of Cloud Advisory at Maven Wave. Welcome, Brad. Hi, thanks guys, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank, thanks Brad, good to see you, meet you for the first time. So tell me, you're in Tampa. My good old uh, buddy Tom Brady is is also there. Do you guys have beer together? Do you kind of catch up with him at all around around the Tampa uh, area? For sure. Actually, a little known fact. Uh, I'll let you guys in a secret. So my wife is Brazilian, and uh, that's what brought them down. They're, they're, her, she's best buds with Giselle, and they you know she she talked the the, the Brady family into to coming down, playing some football in the Tampa area, so we get a championship. I just relocated from Chicago where. The Bears were not so hot recently, but uh, yeah, Tom Tom Gell came down, got us a championship, no problem. <laughs> all right, well, I'm, I'm in Boston, so I, I, I'm not happy about the situation at all. <laughs> but what I am interested to learn about is you and your team and uh, what you've been up to during the pand pandemic. Have, have you had to shift or reposition yourselves at all? And give us a background on how you help enterprises today. Yeah, yeah I think, I mean, we obviously all move to a work from home model and, and some of those things. So I, nothing out of the ordinary in terms of the, the things we've had to, to deal with, with how do you keep the, the culture alive and vibrant and virtual happy hours and, and things like that. But um, I think, and then just, I think helping our customers change some of their journey has been you know, interesting. I'll give a you know, two or three examples of things that have, that have been fun to do one you know, in uh, health, our healthcare space was one of our, our top areas uh, helping some companies go to telemedicine. So, I mean, they had to make a flip too virtually and we're a large partnerships you know, with Google and obviously have Google meet and other things. And uh, within a couple months, we were able to help integrate virtual conferencing into So Epic is kind of a very well-known uh, system that all um, uh, Cerner and Epic, the most all hospitals use for all the patient information and, uh, so we integrated just point and click where a physician could be within the system. They're in all the time taking the notes about you and the visit and open a, a virtual meeting with Google with their patient, multiple, you know, the patient and the patient's caregiver, whatever it may be. Um, so rolling something like that, that out real time for actually the state of, this is a, some press release information recently with the state of Rhode Island and recently state of Wisconsin, things like virtual career centers. So obviously unemployment is massive. People are trying to get back to work, but they couldn't go to career centers. They would normally go to, um, to get help and, and placement and uh, services. So we were uh, rolled out that in Rhode Island that went live uh, recently. And then we're doing the same for uh, Wisconsin, and hopefully some more States where uh, those services are all virtual, like uh, virtual uh, career fairs and, and things. And then the, the most, the fun, the, the biggest one, which we all can relate to is we help the DMV, uh, implement uh, capabilities to renew licenses and other things 100% online. So imagine not having to go to a DMV anymore and just submit photos and other things online, your documentation, as long as you, you know, you're, you're not you know, checking the box that you're a felony uh, or, <laughs> or a felon or something like that. You, they, they send you your, your information in the mail, your license in, in the mail. And so that was another fun one that just kind of, you know, they had to do because people 
they were losing revenue um, because people just couldn't go to the office and renew and other things like that. So it's been fun to see some of those things come uh, to the market and come fast. Yeah, and, and you know, even non-pandemic times, every minute you spend waiting in that DMV line, you're thinking, this definitely can be done better. Like, <laughs> what are we thinking? This is archaic. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's, it's amazing. What, what an amazing world that we live in, uh, you know, as a uh, person who was raised, born and raised in Rhode Island with my, my family still there. Um, you know, these, these are remarkable, remarkable things that projects that you're deploying, uh, really helping families. Uh, so I really salute you, especially during these times. Um, it seems like everyone today is also talking about AI, machine learning. There's a lot of interest there, of course. And I know you oversee these portions of uh, this portion of Maven Weaves business. When do you think these technologies can really help enterprises? Are there any instances that come to mind? Are they too far out? Are they happening now? What type of applications um, are really meaningful uh, to you? Yeah, no, I'm, there are legitimate uses of it now that are are helping businesses. I think. In the whole you know height curve moment and you, the chasm, you know, you're crossing the chasm and all, all those those references that it was super hyped up uh, four or five years ago, and people thought it's going to save the world and it's push button easy, and um, they started to realize it's not that easy. And uh, you have somebody that's running a a manufacturing plant, and maybe the line goes down twice a year for two different re complete reasons and they think you can predict when it's going to go down next. I mean, they don't realize that if it doesn't occur that frequently, then you can't predict something It's very hard. And so people just didn't weren't educated about how AI can be applicable and what you need to make it successful. I think people have kind of come back down to reality now and are more pragmatically understanding that combination of, of data and situations that you need to make it useful. Um, and we are seeing now success, especially in uh, areas of, of, of prediction, you know, forecasting or, or downtime. We mentioned, you know, uh, theme park operators and, you know, ride downtime or uh, for large, uh, I'll call it package distribution companies that we work with, where we're helping them forecast the demand through all of their, their network of facilities. And it's very important for them to understand, are you, you have you know, Amazon one and two day delivery and, they really want to know exactly when things are arriving and they, they have mountains of data uh, and they have real uh, useful ways in which they can apply it. So we've started to find uh, things uh, that are really helping companies move the needle. Um, and then this, the, the other thing that, that has really been a trend for us is it's about enablement. A lot of most companies want to maintain that secret sauce in house uh, because it is a little bit of a black box and their predictions and other things are differentiated IP. If they can deliver the package faster because that that IP of AI is helping them, that's that's money in their pockets and that's differentiation. Differentiation, and uh, so it's, it's also we've been helping enable them to do the AI. They don't understand some of the cloud platforms, how to stand up these sandboxes easily, control them, put sensitive data there so they can use that. Uh, and so a lot of what we've been doing recently that's been very successful is uh, helping them stand up the platform, train them on it in scale their organization so that we can kind of let them, you know, you can take the training wheels off, so to speak, and they can really start scaling that into more use cases in the organization. Um, so that's been fun to really kind of help them on that, that journey as well. That's fantastic. I, I love to hear those stories in particular, the uh, healthcare IT initiatives. I, I was a HIMSS social media ambassador for a couple of years and it's, it was amazing to see even pre-pandemic, how healthcare is really lagging in digital and cloud adoption, and this this push we all saw from, you know, less than one percent utilization to like thirty percent utilization of telehealth and telemedicine in a matter of months. You know, what are you know for companies that are still lagging in shifting to the cloud and and to all the benefits therein? You know, what are some of the best practices? What kind of advice do you give? companies uh, who, who may be looking? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, as we all know, there are, there are people who like to lead the charge and don't mind being there, realizing they're going to make some mistakes and spend a little bit more money to do it than if you wait and it's already been solved. But when you wait, you also don't have the 
the advantage. Sometimes you know the first movers capture the market and and uh, set the tone and capture the customer base, etc. Et um, for the uh, for those companies that maybe are struggling or still skeptical uh, about going there, which I think it is dwindling down. I think people have come to a bit of a conclusion that we're going to the cloud. It's not a much, as, as much about the education convincing them anymore that it's secure and it's easier to, to manage than their data centers. I think now what they're struggling with is the how, like, how do I get there? Like I have this, you know, 50 year old legacy environment of all this stuff. And uh, it's mes- you know, it's just mesmerizing to understand all the dependencies and they just end up in gridlock. Oh, I'll move this. Wait a minute. That's connected to that. And then that's connected to that. And then they can it's, um, somewhat end up in this gridlock of uh, just getting started and, and becomes overwhelming. So I think one of the things, a couple of things we focus on to remove that friction is a, they have to have some executive buy-in and in making that move and setting the tone at the business and IT level that they are going to be a company that is, is going to be leading the charge and, uh, and, and digital. And we see that some of our enterprises such as financial services, asset management companies, uh, when they're talking to new clients, the clients are looking at tech. You'd think it's not just about how much money you're going to make me for this, this billion dollar fund. It's tell me what technology you're using underneath. What AI do you have? Are you running on the mainframe still? Well, you know, if not, I'm going to go with the company that's not on the mainframe. So tech for these company, you know, companies from a leadership perspective is becoming an important component of their plan and it has to be leadership driven. And the second is you really try to, yeah, we have, a, and that's why I'm leading cloud advisory now is, is the focus on that journey. We call it, you're not going to go, cl- go to cloud overnight. It's going to be a multi-year journey. You're going to be in this hybrid state. You're, you're going to have some things that are going to remain on-prem for a while mainframes, big Oracle installs that are integrated, those are going to take time to unwind. So let's create the roadmap of some simple wins, some value you can get, new things that you're doing. Don't do those on-prem, do those on cloud. Um, so we're really sitting down and, and helping them create like a, a, real, a pragmatic uh, journey there. Um, and, and that's helping uh, organizations quite a bit and, and kind of calming down and, and seeing, a, uh, seeing some light in a path you know, to getting there. Yeah, I, I love that. The pragmatic multi-year hybrid journey where you're roadmapping those wins. I think that's that's really critical to think about that. You can't just swipe a credit card and ha- have all these services arrive at your doorstep like da ding, like Jeannie yeah. just bought it and and the hybrid hey, I do that all I do that all the time. Come on, Jeannie. <laughs> <laughs> I saw your genie bottle and wondered. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's banging out code uh, yeah, on, on the weekends. You didn't know that? Like uh, but and I, I think the hyperscalers too. And, and we we are great partners with them, um, but at the same time, right? Their motivation is they want your business. They want you on the cloud as fast as possible, and so they want to make it seem easy and and everything else. They want the wave of consumption to to start and the meter to start ringing. Um, and, and so I think our our job is helping educating our clients on the realities that yes, there's some stuff that can go there easy, and yes, you should start using it. You shouldn't be managing your data center anymore, um, but there are some things that aren't that easy and it takes some more time. And, and, you know, we have options to help them through, through that as well. And what are the things that aren't so easy about moving to the cloud? Um, I think there's uh, two things that come to mind as as the main, um, not necessarily challenges, but things you have to just make sure you plan correctly for, or you'll find yourself stumbling or, and you, you won't be efficient or effective, or you'll have some risk. Um, and this has happened to, to a lot of clients out there where data gets exposed or they, somebody hacks their servers and Bitcoin mines on their, their cloud servers, uh, is, is the operational aspect of it. Uh, it. Some people, I think when they were early, <clears throat> just thought of cloud that and move things there and great, it's, it's simple. And they have a thousand person running an on-prem data center operation, taking tickets and monitoring things and keeping firewalls up to date, all this stuff. And then they would <clears throat> put five people on the cloud services team and think, oh, great. Now, and, and all of a sudden they would have this massive demand because you don't have to wait on servers and everything else. And the business teams, IT teams start building applications and data lakes. And, and then you ended up with this team that's just completely overwhelmed and the CISO is getting nervous and the, the you know, heads of infrastructure and other people are just, oh my gosh. And they'll just like time out, time out, stop. Everybody stop what you're doing. 
we have to invest more in this in this our operations and our foundation to make sure data isn't leaked and the wrong people have access to things and people are are, are not you know coding things in a manner that's that's uh, creating risk etc. Um, so it's really about making sure you have that right <clears throat> sized operations team that is also implementing those operations as the need uh, is there for the, the types of workloads that are there. You don't need to you know, spend two years building the perfect bulletproof foundation and finally let your organization start using cloud. That's completely wrong way to tackle it. But you also can't be in the other spectrum of let the wild west happen and then you wake up and you have all sorts of things that are, are risk of risk organization and very difficult to like rein back in into common patterns and, and other things. So I think making sure you have you know, that uh, under control in the right balance is key. And the second thing is just acknowledging the legacy stuff that can't go to cloud and having a plan to, again, pragmatically attack that, you know, mainframe, for example, that people would have been off the mainframe. It was that easy. People would have been off the mainframe 10 years ago. Um, so it's not that easy. And you can't just have a salesperson come in and pitch you that, Hey, in 12 months, you'll be off your mainframe and let's move it to cloud. That's not realistic. Um, but they do need to get off the mainframe. There are major pressures coming with workforce retirement and you know, the vendors jacking up prices and other things that that uh, they, they have to get off. And so I think just acknowledging how you manage the stuff that can't go to cloud right now over the next five years and how you have kind of a, a slower modernization journey to address that uh, at the same time is key. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, companies are trying to move from information to, you know, you know insight and how do you help them in that journey? And you know, what are the struggles in in trying to get their hands around big data in the enterprise? Yeah, I think the uh, companies that are doing it well and, and see success have moved towards an agile method of delivering insights to the organization, and and I call it product driven and agile and. Uh, when I say agile and product driven, it's not that you have a, a 15 minute daily stand up at 9 a.m. And, and meet and talk about stuff. It's the concept that a business person owns the outcome. They're the product manager and they have something they're trying to improve and achieve. And they feel data and insights are a part of them you know, achieving that objective. Uh, going back to you know, a, a a ride downtime scenario. Hey, I, as an organization, lose money when a ride goes down, people don't go through a gift shop and this customer satisfaction goes down and all these things happen. How would I possibly understand, pull data to understand when I could prevent that? I could do pre pre preventive maintenance and, and then that's a real outcome to the organization. And so when companies are aligning to an outcome and they put a business person in control of leading the charge and equip it kind of with this, this uh, cross-functional team um, to then execute, they see those outcomes much more effectively. And it, it goes all the way to the deployment into the day-to-day op -day operations to the, to the screens. We always say that sometimes they'll lose the battle in the, the last 18 inches, which is the distance between your, your nose and the screen that they don't focus on, well, how is the person going to be alerted that they need to do something? Or what's the dashboard? Is the dashboard they're, they're using really useful or is it not useful? Or is, is this supposed to be a new mobile app that a consumer can interact with data and see all sorts of things about you know, their appliances and, and whatever, whatever it may be. So we really focus on that end, making sure literally they get the end to end value um, throughout that entire process versus so, you know, and, and companies are changing. So in the past, they would just build, spend two years building these behemoth data platforms. I'd go, let me go put all the enterprise data in a data warehouse. And then IT would give you some reports. There would be very little collaboration with the business people. And the business people like, this isn't really what I need. They would ask for something new. It would take three months for IT to give them a new updated report. And, and that just, you know, they were wasting millions and tens of millions of dollars building these data platforms that the business just never used uh, to the extent that they, they needed. So this kind of product centric agile approach um, we've seen has really delivered the value to the organization. And then over time, you just find yourself after you've done 10 of those with kind of a data warehouse with multiple data sets in it that, that people can then reuse for, for uh, other purposes. But that's how we're seeing success. Yeah, we see that so much uh, from a data-driven marketing perspective, you know, uh, just because it's a data stream doesn't make it useful uh, and has to be in line with business objectives. So um, 
uh, completely understand uh, your point there. And now, Brad, I'd love to transition this and really talk about you, know, you as a person, about your career, as we always do here on Data Movers. Tell us a bit about your journey to Maven Wave. How did you become one of the top partners at this fast growing company? And, and I just wanna even take a second to say, you know, Maven Wave just recently got acquired by Atos in 2019, also won three times in a row, most recently this past 2020 year, the Google Cloud North America Service Partners of the Year Award, like big, big news here in Google Cloud world. Um, so, so tell us, how did, how did you become partner? What was the path like? Yeah, um, so I actually started my career was at Anders Consulting, so I can date, you know, if you want to date myself, uh, that uh, before it was Accenture is when I, when I started there, I uh, went deep into tech at the time. I'm an engineering major from U of I, Champaign, and, uh, and really kind of got my foundational there. Left there and was the first employee at uh, a startup called Fathom Solutions. And uh, it was when the telecom deregulated. And there I really cut my teeth on, on large, growing into management, management positions, understanding run, you know, how to run large scale programs, $200 million programs with, with Fortune 500s and, and, and those types of things. Um, and uh, then we were acquired by Cognizant. So I then saw the boom of all the offshore things happen and, and cut my teeth on global delivery models and, and that. I actually took a break at that point in time, started a, a home renovation business in Chicago, oh, cool. and uh, and which was a fun part of my life. And, and believe it or not, has served me well when I came back into consulting. Just uh, when you're dealing with homeowners and budgets and timelines and expectations, I mean, all those things just sharpen your skills when, when you're in any client service industry, right? And um, so uh, as odds would have it, uh, I was... Uh, met my now wife in Brazil and I was traveling there and the founders of Maven Wave were also the founders of the previous company of Fathom Solutions. We always kept in touch, they're pers you know, close personal friends. And uh, they kind of started throwing me a couple of projects like, hey, we know your, consult your construction thing's going great. Uh, would you want to, there's a project with the Chicago Cubs and I'm a huge Cubs fan. Like, would you want to work on this for three months? I'm like, oh, you know what? I, yeah, I want to you know, do that, do, do some consulting there. And um, and then one of the projects I was in Brazil and like, Hey, there's this cloud thing. Uh, would you want to work on that? It's kind of this little, this migration thing going on. I was like, that's interesting. And uh, so I, I worked on that and it was really my first introduction to cloud. And, uh, and it, we were moving a bunch of data from on-prem to virtual machines and other applications in the cloud. It was very early. This was going on at Google, very, very early Google days when they had very few products um, there. And, uh, and I remember, met the client a couple of times with a lot of virtual meetings. And then I was executing data migrations from a balcony in Brazil, looking at the ocean. And before you would have to be plugged into a, somebody's network in their office or in their data center or whatever. And I just my mind's like, this just seems like where the world would want to go. Who wouldn't want to have the flexibility to use technology in a way that doesn't confine you to walls and other things? And, um, and so they had always said, there's an open door. If you ever want to work, come back and work with us, I'll let us know. And so when my wife and I decided we we're going to get engaged and married and decide we're going to go back to Chicago versus live in Brazil. Um, yeah, I said, hey, I, I want to join forces with you guys again. So that was, I think, maybe it was only about 20 or 30 people at that point in time. And uh, from there, we really, uh, you know, it was literally grassroots ground up, uh, just hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, building our Google channel, working with clients, we've done work in you know, AWS and Azure as well. Um, but it was a lot of energy and effort in those cloud days, like tire kickers, education, POCs. I mean, it, you really just had to do anything and everything you could to learn uh, what you could about cloud, where this was going, make some mistakes. Uh, and, and we were lucky enough, I think, to be early in that journey, especially with Google as a go-to-market um, partner. Uh, and as a small company, uh, everybody would take a meeting with Google. Nobody would take a meeting with Maven Wave, right? And they, who's Maven Wave? Uh, but any Fortune 500 company wanted the Google magic. And so our go-to-market strategy was, let's just get good, at, really good at Google technology. They, they love our consulting capabilities. They don't they didn't really have and still don't have a large professional services organization. So let's bring our balance of consulting uh, know-how with the technology skills and certifications. Um, and so that just proved to be an amazing partnership that... Uh, we just leveraged uh, and, and in both sides uh, really 
grew and learned from that from the partnership and that's i think why we're partner of the year three times in a year i think to, still today we have more specializations on google than any company in the world you know your centers deloitte we have more than them and so we really just kind of grew that and uh, through the years and to where we're hundreds of people and uh and now acquired by ato so it's been a been a very fun journey that is, yeah, eight or nine years. That's that's quite a good run in in the technology world. So well done, and 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 so looking forward, you know, tell us what you're excited about at Maven Wave, and, and a little bit about your relationship with Atos, who, you know, we in the industry know is this just gigantic IT technology and services company, uh, maybe less known in the U.S., yeah. but how do you collaborate within that organization? Yeah, I mean, some things I'm excited about um, a are you know, continuing to grow our AWS and Azure relationships. We had already had a plan as Maven Wave to uh, we were finally getting to the size where you, you could start getting into those channels uh, in the same manner and scale that we we had invested in Google. Atos brings you know they have a very strong Microsoft partnership uh, worldwide, so we get it's a major acceleration into the channel there and then our combined we already done quite a lot of work in aws uh and that with atos capabilities so i'm really excited about where we're going to go with con the continued google success as well as uh continued success in, in the other channels and then uh, you're, you're you're spot on that you know atos is like more of a household name in europe and wanting to grow their presence in north america hence why they want to acquire companies like Maven Wave to really kind of try to accelerate that that growth and that that household name recognition. I think the the thing that's very complementary about uh, you know Atos's fundamental skills and ours is that they were more traditional data center networking, security, large scale managed services. Uh, we were more tip of the spear, digital transformation, cloud. Uh, and we were looking going, wow, if I have to build a large scale managed service operation globally to capture this you know, managing cloud uh, environments for fortune thousand companies, that's a lot of energy. That's a lot of investments. And, and by the time we build that, we'll miss the market. Uh, and so we're looking and, and we didn't, we're growing our infrastructure organization, but same thing, you're like, wow, this market is here. And so, uh, and, and they were looking the same, like they know they had to do something to accelerate their front end digital transformation consulting type in cloud capabilities. So it was a very complementary uh, match in terms of, of our teams coming together. So I think what we're seeing is we can bring so much more to the table for our clients and in, in, in a true end to end story that isn't false anymore. If we were trying to tell, oh, well, we sure we have 300 people to run a managed service globally for you. Like, no, we don't. I mean, it's just really hard for a client to believe that. And the same thing it was hard for a client to believe them on, on the tip of the spear innovation. So now when our collective teams sit down with clients and talk about what we can do, it's really fun to see that I don't, we don't want to be scared of having any conversation that that journey to cloud I'm talking about where we want to talk about, let's move this stuff to cloud. It's easy. Or let's build new cool things like, Hey, Maven wave all day long. Ooh, you need to you need to do something like manage Oracle or a mainframe. Atos is coming in and their, their core teams, they're, we're standing up co-located facilities that are cross-connected to the hyperscalers. You have one millisecond, it's basically, it, you know, for all intents and purposes, inside Google and Amazon and Azure data centers. So now your mainframe runs at the same speed with cloud as it runs talking to other mainframe applications. They're able to do things like that, that reduce the friction, um, allow clients to go on this journey and bring major firepower to like the infrastructure move uh, and kind of legacy move, uh, as well as we have major capabilities for that modernization. They have IP and other things that accelerate things like converting COBOL to Java and, and, um, and kind of, you know, getting the applications modernized. Uh, so that, that combination uh, of skills with them, uh, I think has allowed us to be very creative with customers on listening to them and trying to find something that you know, matches what they need to do versus just here's our widget, here's our methodology, like go, go, go. And if you don't like to do it that way, then you know, we don't want to listen to you. So that, that's been a very exciting part about, about the, the merger. Yeah, it sounds so complimentary with skill sets and reach and um, capabilities. Um, and again, you know, always just boils down to good people attracting good people. And uh, certainly, you know, uh, personally, that's true with, with our Maven Wave family. Um, we also know that you, uh, um, you, you, Brad, 
also manage large teams. Uh, what makes an ideal team member for a technology and, and consulting firm like Maven Wave? What advice do you have for folks who really want to launch a career in the industry? Yeah, I mean, it, um, my advice, and this is what we tell our team members, and these are our fundamental hiring values, uh, actually have nothing to do with cloud or technology specifically, because that's all going to change over, over our careers if you stay in technology. So we boil down to some other fundamentals, uh, first being critical thinking and problem solving capability. If you're, can you just fundamentally understand a problem, break it down and solve it with whatever methods, tools, and, and oftentimes you have to define those methods and tools um, because we're doing things for the first time. Um, the second is then the aptitude and design hunger to learn. Uh, this stuff is constantly changing. It's almost exhausting sometimes how fast this tech is coming into market. You're trying to keep up with all of the hundreds of Google and Azure and AWS products and what they can do. I mean, it's, it's uh, you have to enjoy being in that environment and, uh, and grabbing out of those things, and, but also being able to pick them up quickly and apply them. Uh, and then the third is really communication and relationship skills. I mean, I, I tell my team all the time, we're not in a technology business, we're in a relationship business. We're any services company, you're, you're providing a service and they're hiring you because they trust you um, as people to get the job done for them. Uh, the technology works. I mean, it's, it's working and is, it's moving at a pace that's faster than people can even consume it and get value out of it. So it really comes down to the people uh, getting the job done and, and communicating well with the client, gelling well with the clients and forming like that optimal team that then the works works well together. So it's you really just have to become good at being a part of a team, being a part of a client, communicating well uh, and interacting. If, and if you have the, if you're really strong at those three things, you're generally going to be a very successful person. And and I think any job that you have, but definitely a successful a successful consultant. Yeah, no, those are awesome. Those three tips, absolutely, what we look for when uh, hiring our next JSA or. Um, and, and what we want to teach our kids, really, yeah. uh, you know, uh, they are just uh, the, the roadmap to success for, for, uh, for any, any person uh, trying to develop themselves. Um, so uh, Evan and I love this next sort of section of data movers. We call it rapid fire, where we just kind of shout a few phrases and we like to hear the first thing that comes to mind, our rapid fire fun facts about Mr. Brad Buster. So are you ready? Sure, let's do it. All right. First, talking Chicago. Everyone loves to talk Chicago and culinary bliss. Uh, top restaurant recommendations in Chicago. Um, that, that's like a, such a tough one, as you know, because Chicago has so many good spots to eat and there's new ones popping up uh, all the time. One that, that kind of comes to mind that my wife have been, and I happen to be going back to is a uh, Momotaro. It's a, a sushi spot that's it in the booming kind of west loop area which now has just so many great restaurants popping up and is kind of the, the hot spot of, of chicago so we just kind of find, find ourselves in a groove there that this some amazing sashimi and, and other things that they they were doing there so that's one that popped to mind that I, I i've probably been to 10 times over the past uh you know th three or four years at least so it, uh, I'll, I'll go with that one although there are you know endless other options as you guys know in chicago for great food yeah, sushi's always good for me. I, I, I'm such a Japanese cuisine fan. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually eating sushi now. You just can't, you can't, I'm kind of turning my yeah. head. You can't yeah. see it. Yeah. <laughs> off camera of chopsticks flying around. Yeah, exactly. It's good. That's good to sneak in because it's like small bites. You can just pop one in. <laughs> Not like you can't eat a burger on camera. That doesn't work. No. no. I have. I've done that. It worked, <laughs> it worked fine. <laughs> Um, Evan, you want to take the next one? I know this is yeah, uh, favorite sport to watch live. And I think I know the answer, but I'll let you go ahead. That one for me is ice hockey. Um, I, I just think worst, worst sport to watch live. Absolutely the worst. Yeah. You can't check. You can't follow the puck. You can't see oh, what the puck is. It's, it's yeah. That, I, well, I, I, I still can for some reason, but yeah, for me, the, the, the energy, like the, the impact, like the speed, I think people don't realize like how fast those guys move on ice. And uh, I, I grew up playing all sports and I'm a huge sports fan. So I, I like to watch them all. So it's a tough question to answer, but uh, yeah, I, uh, they all have different aspects for like baseball as being a big Cubs fan. It's like a big party in the stadium. 
uh, so I enjoy right. watching it, but also it's three hours of drinking and eating with your friends. It's like an outdoor bar. Uh, so that, that experience is when we have an annual Cubs outing, we'll hopefully, I don't know if this year will start again. Obviously we had to cancel last year, but, uh, that's you know, anybody who's been to Wrigley knows that that's a pretty amazing experience overall as well. Yeah. It makes me miss it. All right. So any languages you speak besides English, any words that would come out of your mouth in the Wrigley's field? <laughs> Sim, eu posso falar português. Oh, português. Beautiful. <laughs> well, it makes sense with your beautiful Brazilian wife. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I so I, I, I figure I better learn that or else all my family in Brazil is going to be saying all sorts of things. And, and I'm not going to know, are they talking about me? What are they saying? <laughs> uh, so I, I better, better uh, get sharp in my Portuguese so I can really be a part of the, the family down there and interact with them. And, and I think the next question is pretty obvious. Favorite place to travel? I think we know. That too. Yeah, it, that's definitely one of the, the top ones. And I, I find my, found myself going down there. Uh, I went down a couple of times and you know, met my wife and went, was going back. And we, uh, we recently bought a house there um, that uh, we'll stay in when we go down and visit family and then try our, try our hand at the Airbnb thing a little bit here. But I, I would also say it's any beach location. I'm, I'm big on water, uh, scuba diving, surfing, even swimming pools, I just I love water, and then in all sense boating, and um, so I've, I've been lucky Rio, enough to Rio, be Rio, lots Rio of, de Janeiro. Yeah, lots of beautiful beaches uh, in the world in my life. So that's definitely, and Brazil has a ton of them. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, water just makes you happy. You know, when you can look out and see an ocean, it just guides them around. Brings know? calmness. Yeah. 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 So okay, number one piece of parenting advice. Uh, I would say consistency and persistence pays off. Uh, I think anyone who's, so I, uh, I have stepsons who are now 21 and 24, uh, but I've known them since, uh, been part of my life since they were eight and 11. And now I've also have a five-year-old daughter and, um, it, you know, you, you're going through, we all kind of half make it up while we're, we're doing it anyway. Or, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing or not. I'm just going to do what I think's right. And, and, uh, and you don't quite know <laughs> if all those messages and lessons and things you're telling them are going to sink in or not. It seems like they're not, especially in teenage years, like these are you know, the knuckleheads. Uh, they're not listening to anything I say, but then you know, now that they've gotten to the age they're, they're at, you kind of realize like, wow. And they, they've told me specifically, Hey, thank you so much for you and, and mom like being hard on us and doing those things we we know we were difficult and we didn't want to listen to you at the time but now they're saying those things to their friends or they're acting that way and so it's all that persistence and consistency of messaging uh where you're like oh okay thank god like <laughs> it, it, it worked to some extent at least um but yeah. you you have, you have to have faith because you got i don't know if you guys have kids but in the moment, you're just like, I don't know if this is the, you know, they're going to ever turn this. Yeah, around. my my parenting goal. I just don't want to have them hate my guts. If, <laughs> if I achieve that, I will be consider myself a successful. Yeah, parent. totally. Yeah. Uh, the other last question we have is kind of back to your career. Eight, almost nine years. What's your favorite memory or, or moment from the those nine years? Yeah, so I'll pull one in from the you know going back to the, the Cubs out you know outing, and we actually had a. A leadership meeting right before this and uh we asked a bunch of people about you know some questions and one was like what would you do if you had a magic wand you know, and change it maven way or what would you do and uh surprisingly out of the, the 20 kind of main leaders in our company several were talking about oh the bring the cubs game back this year or whatever and um so hey it's just our whole company gets together we call them first fridays and then in the one in august usually we do a cubs outings it's kind of various events on the first friday of every month and so one year a few years ago, this is probably now six or seven years ago. It was probably I was in the company one or two years. Um, I'm in kind of known as the person in the company that kind of livens some stuff up, our quarterly meetings or whatever. I started adding some funny things to it. And now that it's really taken off and our company meetings are a blast and just hilarious, the creativity and, and skills people have outside of consulting. People come and do full on singing things. So one of the years I and I started a recognition program where we do things that take away awards. And so that we're going to the Cubs game. I dressed up as Harry Carey um, in the office and we're like, okay, time for recognition. And so I had my Budweiser and my Harry Carey outfit and I was doing the whole shtick, my best impression of Harry Carey. 
and uh, giving out the, you know, the recognition and all that. And they're like, everybody enjoy the game. See you guys at the stadium. And uh, so people are like, no, no, you can't change. You, you have to go is Harry Carey. Like you go, go. And I'm like, okay, whatever. Fine. I'll go to the, so I go to the game and basically every year I end up on the jumbotron because <laughs> I was like, and people are taking pictures with me in the stadium and the, the whole company's taking pictures. And like everybody just got so into it and, and, and loved it. And so the next year, everybody's like, is Harry coming? Harry has to come. So now it's been an annual thing. And to top it all off, there's a place called Deuces and Diamonds that has kind of a, a pool in, in outdoors. Um, it's, not, it's like a you know, four foot wide by 12 foot long, like two little pools in this outdoor patio. And um, so as I was going to go change clothes and normal clothes, as after the game, we were there for a couple hours. I'm like, okay, I can go change normal clothes. I was walking. They have these little stairs that go up. And walking across, and the whole bar started chanting, Harry, Harry. <laughs> and I paused, and I looked at the water, and I was just like, you know what? Screw it. And I just did a full-on belly flop uh, you know, into the, into the pool. And, and, and our whole company has it on video. So that was the first year. And then it became this legend of, hey, is Harry showing up? Is Harry doing belly flop? And so it's been a, a yearly thing that everybody expects Harry Carey to show up. And, and it, assuming we're going to do some diamonds, like the belly flop's going to happen. And then I, I took it a whole nother level. And in, in uh, Google, two years ago, Google had one of their conferences in Chicago at Navy Pier, one of their Google summits. And I was speaking on you know, the five barriers to moving data to the cloud and how to overcome them with the, the guy who worked for me that headed our data practice. And it was a big Navy Pier Chicago theme. And I called him up that morning. I said, Todd, I don't know. I've spent, spoken at multiple of these things now. I'm tired of hearing myself talk about data or AI or cloud. We're going to liven this up. I said, I'm going as Harry Carey. You, do, you know the content. You do the slides. I'm just going to try to add some you know, humor to this to liven up these conferences or whatever. And he's like, OK. And I'm like, this is either going to be disastrous uh, and crash and burn, or maybe it'll go off well. And, and I had, so I brought in a cooler of Budweiser's and we're up on stage and I'm just, we're going back and forth and it ended up working out very well. And people at the conference, like, thank God, thanks for the break and the monotony of these conferences. And we actually ended up getting two or three decent sized client deals out of, uh, out of that. So, uh, so the Harry Carey thing. Did you, did you, that. did you, did you jump off Navy Pier though? That, that's the question. <laughs> yeah, I, I did it. Uh, I, did, I did sing the seventh inning stretch in the middle of the presentation. I, it, was the, it was the seventh slide stretch. When we got to the seventh slide, I, I did a full on musical number. Uh, yeah, so it was. Uh, That's awesome. Well, I, I look forward to I always love combining business and alcohol. It's just a great yeah. oh, I combination. Think well, look, it was really great chatting with you and learning about your mission and congratulations on all the success and look forward to grabbing a couple of mojitos on the beach, whether it's uh, Tampa or LA or uh, Rio, so we'll yeah. have to just find the place. For sure. Where are you guys located? I forgot to ask. I'm uh, I'm uh, actually right on the beach, so. Oh, nice. Uh, in Laguna. And I, I I live in Jamie's garden. I, I live in a shed <laughs> in Jamie's garden, but it's been great. I appreciate her uh, having yeah. me, yeah. <laughs> or at least allowing you to be there, kind of you know, un unknowingly. <laughs> This was so much fun. Thank you so much, Brad. What uh, amazing insight and tips for us. And guys, if you've enjoyed this Data Movers podcast, be sure to check us out, jsa.net slash podcast for upcoming Data Movers episodes that drop every other week on Wednesdays. Also, check us out on Twitter at jscotto at Evan Christel. And as always, happy networking.